Hi everyone. Today, very keen, very excited as well to be talking to Jay Reed. Jay Reed is a licensed psychotherapist based in California. He helps people recover from narcissistic abuse. He also has a YouTube channel where he covers topics on that and he uploads on a weekly basis. He also has an online recovery course, which I'm looking forward to talking to talking about rather later on. Hello, Jay. Hi, Darren. Really happy to be here. Good to be here with you as well. And I'm just curious, what got you into the, the realm of helping people recover from narcissistic abuse? How, how did that come about for you? Yeah, well, at this kind of early stages of my career as a therapist, I found that a lot of the folks who came to therapy, at least that I was working with, um, didn't seem to kind of have a whole lot of, I guess, you know, in psychology, we'd say pathology in terms of how they saw the world, how empathic they were, their capacities to sort of work and love generally. But what more seemed to be the source of their problems or even suffering in their lives was having to maintain relationships to someone who was quite different. And in one way or another, it seemed to have to regard the clients as less than, mm. you know, this other person. And also sort of seemed to act in very self-absorbed ways and kind of insist that the clients accommodate that. And what would, you know, the process of therapy that tended to unfold was together we begin to kind of identify like, huh, so, you know, you maybe have believed that you don't communicate well enough, you're, you're not empathic, or that you're even selfish. Meanwhile, like this partner or this parent seems to be really, as I at least observed, treating you in exactly the, those ways, yet you had to carry around this, this mantle that it's, you're the one who's sort of the problem in the relationship. I'm the villain. Yeah. Exactly. And I just, I, I don't know, personally, I think that really just appeals. It, I just, I think at its core, find it to be an unjust arrangement. And the, uh, it's very, has always been appealing to me to kind of try to, you know, when we observe injustices in this regard, to try to ally with, you know, who the injustice is being done to and see if there's a way to try to hopefully uh, restore things so that there's more balance and they get to kind of, experience themselves as they actually are rather than having to feel sort of or internalize a sense of kind of subjugation or feeling less than that I think is necessitated when you're in relationship to someone who is like pathologically narcissistic yeah um, yeah. yeah it's it's something that came up for me as well I noticed a lot of people and I know it, it sounds like a little bit of an internet joke an internet meme but the number of people that go to therapy because of the other people in their lives and that was a recurring right. thing coming up and the number of people who would be, you know, wondering what's wrong with me. I just can't seem to get through to them and I, I can't seem to be uh, make myself understood. I, I'm struggling to assert myself. And when I do, am I being selfish? Am I, a lot of people had no concept at all that this was actually unhealthy. This was coercive. It had been normalized for so long. Now, whether that was through their upbringing or whether that was through the long-term relationship, you know, maybe 10, 20 years of being married to someone like that. So, yeah, it seemed to be a recurring mm -hmm. theme that was coming up a lot. It's, yeah. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was, I was just going to ask, I mean, and, and when it comes to things like abuse, you know, there's many different areas of abuse, and, and there's neglect and so on. There's many, it's multi-layered, if you will. Um you know, as a therapist, what sort of things would you be looking for? What would you recognize when someone presents? What sort of things might they be talking about? Yeah, well, I guess um, I, I really sort of focus on the, the role known as sort of the scapegoat, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I, th I just think it does such a good job of illustrating kind of what can happen in, in abusive dynamics uh, that are kind of narcissistic in nature, because I think, you know, my way of thinking about that, at least, is that the narcissistic person starts with a core of just worthlessness that often needs to be unconscious, but it's also intolerable uh, to them. And it, one of the ways they, they manage that to kind of sustain a, a fragile but artificially elevated self-esteem or self-worth is to like find it in the other person, which let's say would be a client. Um, 
And they need to be convincing both to, with themselves and typically with the scapegoat or the person who's going to kind of like, you know, carry that worthlessness for the narcissist. Um, so what I, so just as a backdrop, um, what I try to look for to identify signs of such abuse is, you know, is this person kind of exaggerating the, their um, reasons why they're to blame in their lives, mm. um, where they the, the scales always seem to tip towards them. And they tend to tip around two things, at least in my experience, around I'm being I'm defective in essence and or I'm undeserving. Um, and and meanwhile, the counterpart is that the others are, you know, not defective, are s- sort of flawless to a degree. They're beyond reproach, yeah. Right, exactly. Very well put. And 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 more deserving, too. Um, so that can manifest in lots of different ways. Um, in the process, a lot of times it's hard, it can be hard to take credit um, for one's strengths because... That certainly served as that would endanger a relationship to someone who's narcissistic. And um, so so that might serve as another signal. I think generally, too. So amongst th- those sort of like uh, signals that might just show up in their lives, you know, I mean, frankly, if you have if you're put in this role, this sort of scapegoat role, you're going to be unfortunate friends with suffering. And I think, you know, there's just going to be this, I think, fairly prevalent experience of knowing what it's like to suffer, uh, you know, in the world is almost a fact of existence. And that itself, I think, can be kind of important to pay attention to. Yeah. Uh, again, it's, it's like someone's conditioned to believe I don't deserve any better. Yeah, like the air they breathe. It's like, absolutely, and and any anything at all they do get from that person, whether it's the parent or the partner, they have to be so grateful for it. They they don't deserve right. it, or they have to earn it somehow. Yeah, and you know, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry, you go ahead. No, it just brought this 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 vignette to mind where it's like so many. Um, like I think scapegoat survivors, child or, or partners of, of, of a narcissistic parent or, or partner, um, the Christmas mornings for those who are Christian are so emblematic of what you're describing, you know, because when you get a gift from the narcissistic person, it's not about what you think, whether you like the gift. It's maybe trying to feign as though, oh, I like the gift, but then being very quick to show that gratitude. So it becomes a show that like it's just so familiar to many uh survivors i think illustrates your point yeah it's uh, i i often think um, you think of a child growing up in a narcissistic home now regardless of the children there's many different roles and sometimes they change i think that the children and a lot of them talking about real narcissism personality disorder type narcissism here they don't so much mm-hmm. learn to be children or to learn how to be they learn how to behave in certain ways yes man i really like how you put that yeah and even in yeah. their attitude with with different authority figures they start to behave in different right. you know it's just, it, it's like that it it carries on into so many of their other relationships yeah boy and because like then w- what do they do with the experience of being mm. I mean, it's not, you, they have to sort of do that kind of in the shadows or or maybe way away from people. It's not safe to be in the presence of others. Again, with narcissism, it's not safe to feel, to think. It's constantly eroded. It's constantly berated. It's constantly insulted. So it's not safe to just be. So they learn how to behave. Instead. Right. Right. No, I like that so much because it, I mean, there's a lot of legacy of that notion of just being while in relationship to someone that that should be something that's mutually valued and, and protected too. And there's a respect for that. But that, like you said, doesn't exist with someone who's narcissistic yeah. and recovering that it's safe, that you can kind of count on people to protect your own when you're just being, that that's a protected state. I think is an outcome of working in recovery. It's it's not familiar to someone who's suffered this way. And I think that, again, looking at the, the, the children that are raised in homes like that, now you think of a child, a child really hard, well, all of us on some level, but especially children, they are hardwired to be loved. 
and to mm-hmm. be loved unconditionally. Now, we do know there are certain conditions like, you know, don't hit your brother and eat up your grease. <laughs> there are certain conditions, but um, the child knows that even if they mess up, if they screw up, if they misbehave, if they get two out of 10 in their test at school, if they accidentally break the family heirloom, yeah, they may be chastised, there may be dis- discipline, things like that, but the child still feels loved. The mm-hmm. child knows they are loved. And it's more the mm-hmm. behavior that's being addressed, not them. In narcissistic families, everything is conditional. Yes. Yes. Oh. And it's not the behavior. It's them. Yeah. Um, again, growing up in the adulthood, there's still, there's still those conditions. I am only good if. I am only good when. And again, that ties in with the behavioral part, learning how to behave. Learning how mm-hmm. to be as opposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. And as adults, you know, even if you think of an, an adult, even an adult who's exposed to narcissistic abuse. Now, I have to think of it this way. Again, it's hardwired into our very core. Every single one of us, we all have this need. And maybe mm-hmm. this is narcissistic, but it's a healthy level of narcissism, I would like to point out. Every mm-hmm. single one of us have this need to feel important, to feel significant to somebody. You know, on some level, I mean, that's why we belong to groups. We join clubs. We live in communities. We have relationships of different kinds. Is that feeling significant to someone? And when you feel significant to someone who's significant to you, well, you know, we're talking about, you know, hearts and flowers. The world is a lovely place. There's no, there's no offense in you. Everything's wonderful. Mm-hmm. When that significance is conditional, the narcissist is making that significance conditional. And again, that person is never going to meet those conditions. Yeah. No, I think you really captured it there. The, the, it's like a morphing of something that's very kind of pure and one of the best things in life. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's a process, I think, because somebody, you know, even if they have like a nice healthy upbringing and so on, whatever way you want to phrase that, they have a good sense of themselves. It's a process that doesn't happen overnight. It's a little piece at a time. Children are different because they're born into it and they're raised, so it's normalized to some degree. But a fully grown mm-hmm. adult, it's a little piece at a time. It happens over sometimes many years. Right. And there's, it's, it's like the person we all have sort of good faith that mm-hmm. when we're trying to love someone else and, and accept them, that that'll be re, re, uh, repaid in kind. And you're really illustrating how that kind of subtly sometimes gets misshapen. Yeah, and it's, it's you know, we mentioned it a moment ago about how people go to therapy because of the people in their lives who treat them in certain ways. What really doesn't sit well, and I think, again, this is true of every single one of us, we, we are not really equipped for things like malice, unkindness, cruelty. Hmm. We, we generally don't like that. That causes us a lot of distress. It does not sit well with us at all. It doesn't sit well with us when we behave like that. That's why we feel guilt and shame. You know, I will never do that again. But whenever the person who's treating you like that is supposed to be the person closest to you, the person that you're supposed to feel safe with, like, for example, the parent mm-hmm. or the lover, the partner, you know, whenever it's the person closest to you, that is very, very hard to navigate. That's very hard to get your head around. Absolutely. You know, when you said that, I was thinking, well, there are people who seem to exercise malice kind of pretty w- wantonly without any kind of recrimination. But then I was thinking, well, I think when they can do it that way and not experience what you're describing, maybe they dehumanize mm-hmm. the other. And maybe that's in play here, because, I mean, in narcissistic abuse, there is a lot of expression of malice, but I think it often is coupled with a dehumanization of the scapegoat or the, the, the receptacle of that, so that they don't feel that sense of guilt or, I'm a bad person for hurting this person. This person instead, or person, this, this entity deserved it. I gave them what they deserve. Now let me move on. Something like that. It's it's interesting, and uh, you know, um, we chatted briefly before about the concept of the scapegoat. If you could just talk about that for a moment, because there's something I would like to 
to bring to that so yeah well um i think it's um it's well so it goes back I mean, my kind of i was really interested in kind of the origin story of the scapegoat and so apparently it's um it, it came out of a, a biblical scholars kind of writing about this practice in um a jewish village where um right before yom kippur or the day of atonement or the week preceding that there were two goats in in the village and one they would just slaughter uh and then the other though would be there in the village and the i guess the villagers would come around with like their sins for the year and pin it on that goat mm -hmm. uh and then once all the villagers had done that someone would you know hit the goat to kind of go wandering off in in essence being sent into exile and it was really i thought uh illustrative because they said they they'd exile the goat into this rocky headland mm -hmm. um and i like that that story a lot because i think it marries so well to um a human's experience of of um surviving the well being thrust into the role of scapegoat mm -hmm learning and doing what's necessary to survive it. But then this moment or moments that can happen um, where enough distance in one way or another has been gained from the narcissistic abuser or the narcissistic family, where they get to kind of question, where they're kind of in that rocky headland and get to kind of question like, I feel like the world's worst sinner, let's say, but are these my sins? And you know, it can come in a lot of different forms, but I think that most, you know, actual scapegoat survivors who've kind of gone through that process and begun to have that moment of questioning and kind of some healthy skepticism about whether what belongs to them versus what doesn't belong to them, but they've had to believe does, I think leads to kind of these types of forums or um, looking on Reddit, you know, this trying to get information or different frame of reference in which to understand themselves because because their origin story in a deep fundamental way, I don't think makes sense. And in a very healthy way, does, does, doesn't make sense to them. Yeah, and that, that dehumanizing and, and, you know, the scapegoat is given a role. Remember the narcissistic person gives people roles, even their own kids, golden child, lost child, you know, scapegoat and the hero child. There's so many different roles. They're dehumanized and they're given a role. Now, Okay, I'm not saying this is what was going on in biblical days, but there is nothing new under the sun. You can imagine people knowing the scapegoat is there. So they act with impunity. Mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. do what I want. Because the scapegoat will take it. The scapegoat will take the fall. They will always be the blame. And when I get caught out, I will blame them. I will shout at them. When I'm getting whatever, yeah, I will harass them i will dump this all on them acting with impunity because there is someone there to take it yes man and even in the field you know the field of the family what it's what the air is like in that family i could imagine just knowing that scapegoat is there is in the other room you can see them just it can just feel like yeah i get to i have many more entitlements now I get to yell at that person, whatever it is. And it's like, maybe it doesn't even require del deliberation. It's just, yeah. this is who I am because that's who he or she is. Yeah. And, and, you know, even in adult relationships, you see, you know, sometimes people come to see me, sometimes they make comments, sometimes, you know, I read it in other people's blogs and so on. And they're talking about their partner blaming them because it rained the day they went on a picnic. Right. <laughs> exactly. As someone responsible for the weather. And that sounds quite petty. And you hear something like that, you can laugh it off. It's a bit silly. But do you imagine living with someone like that who's who's like that all day, every day on twice on a Sunday? Right. right. And refuses to uh, accept anything other than that. Yeah. Uh, in essence, yeah, he's saying you it, two plus two equals five, but you better agree. There's no. There's no counter argument to that to that person. And sometimes, you know, whenever we see we talk about narcissism, and narcissism can be a component of many different things. It can also be comorbid, but you know, sometimes it makes me think of you know the the Orwell book, nineteen eighty four. At the end of it, they're they're brainwashing Winston about how many fingers am I holding up, and at the end, he's just you know you know okay, five fingers, no, it's only four. Oh, okay, then it's four, it's four. But the guy is telling them no. 
agreeing with me isn't enough. You have to believe it. Right. Right. That's from real malignance, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And it's, yeah, I mean, boy, that, that process of fully offloading your own kind of unwanted feeling, mm -hmm. that's the, like, that's the holy grail for someone kind of, you know, pathological in that regard, right? That the other believes it to be their own themselves. You don't have to force them to anymore. Yeah, it's not even, uh, it's not even just agreeing for the sake of a quiet life. Some narcissists are fine with that as long as you don't challenge them. But then again, when we get the more malignant kind, sometimes it's maybe comorbid with something like psychopathy or something, you know, sociopathy. No, saying it isn't enough. You have to believe it. So. You know, this process, you're, I'm sorry. No, no, you go ahead. No, this process you're, you're talking about, it's like captivated me for a long time. I think if you've, if you've endured it from a, from a narcissistic parent or partner, there's, I mean, if, if without understanding it, it's so easy, I think, to feel as though one has sold oneself out, one has um, d doesn't have the kind of internal fortitude to to not have, um, in essence, said, no, you're holding up four fingers, you know, to, and I see it's so common, that kind of almost self-berating after surviving this, of, I should have stood up or I should have called them, I should have pulled a narcissist card. And it um, it actually led me to uh, write actually a paper called pa on pathological projective identification that is you know I know it's a lot of syllables and all but the goal of that paper was actually to try to translate it into kind of understandable concepts because I think it's so important that in an asymmetrical relationship where like the narcissist has more authority or more power in one way or another and you know the victim has to maintain a tie to that person then if this narcissist is, is doing these things of finding their worthlessness in the other and then using their authority to coerce the other to identify with that worthlessness as their own, there's not, you can't share a reality, which is like the necessary first ingredient to having a relationship. And with a kid, that's just not an option. You have to find a way to share a reality. And it's just, I think, coming to a point of understanding that first and having compassion for what you had to go through when this process was being plied against you, I think is just such an important piece to this uh, journey of recovery. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things I often talk about, about beliefs. Nice. Everybody mm -hmm. has beliefs. We all believe in something. Some people believe in God. Some people believe in law and order. Some people believe in evolution, technology. Everybody has beliefs. You know, sometimes we'll believe the bus is going to get us there on time, but one way or another, they are all there. Your beliefs are yeah. fact or feeling. They are fact or they are feeling. Mm -hmm. That being said, sometimes those feelings are based on facts. Mm -hmm. But they may be facts from other experiences or other situations that they might inform, but they're not necessarily over relevant to this situation. Sometimes they are based on facts that might have been true at one point. Certainly not true today. And sometimes maybe they were never true at all. We were just led to believe that they are, especially being raised in a family like that, they have been hardwired into us. Yeah. But one way or another, if they are fact or they are feeling, and it's something I sometimes do with my clients, let's pick those beliefs apart. Let's look for the evidence. Mm -hmm. Either for or against, by the way. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's yeah, that's a great point because we kind of need to, in some ways, believe our beliefs are factual. So we don't just to function. But in these cases, if you've had, say, a narcissistic parent, parent, you've you've had to adopt beliefs that are entirely uh, feeling based, mm. someone else's feelings, and that's a heck of a process, a needed process to question those beliefs, like you do with your clients. It's not necessarily an easy process, as I say. We all have them, <laughs> you know. Sometimes we call right. them poor beliefs, but they're still beliefs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're either fact or feeling. Yeah. Something you'd said a moment ago, I would like to pick up on. And, and yes, again, when it comes to the beliefs and, and the I'm not good enough kind of, I'm at fault here. There can be a lot of shame as well, because you're right. And this is not uncommon, even 
I'm sure you've seen people comment on your videos as much as I get on mine. A lot of the time it's, why did I? Why didn't I? What was wrong with me? Yeah. Why did I, why did I do this? And there's, again, that scapegoat mentality, it's self-berating, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's, it's this, this um, I feel like it could be this, like, I don't know, like intruder, kind of like in the shadows, in the therapy work. That even in the service of one's earnest desire to kind of like reapportion the accountability for what happened back to the narcissist, exactly what you're describing can kind of rear its head. Like, like I should have stood up to them, or I should have uh, accomplished more in one way or another, or whatever it is. Um, and it, and I think it, I think too, there's even, you know, sort of a place for patience and compassion with that, that, that that itself, you know, is almost like part of the process of kind of expunging this, uh, this thing that's like, like a badge that you never wanted, but it was like stuck on you or well, like the skate code and the process of like ripping it off. It's like, almost like goes through these different layers and, and it's like, maybe this is one of those. Um, but it, yeah, I, I know what you mean. And I think it's the, I, again, I don't think our brains like things that just don't make sense, which is why we often reanalyze things and ruminate them excessively and we replay conversations and moments and so on. Mm. A lot of time from, from that, 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 that abuse, the person who's been abused, the scapegoat, again, it's that self berating. Why? You know, as if it was my fault. No. Yeah, this is this is the thing. If this is someone who's raised in a family, so it's been there the whole time. It's been there from pretty much birth. What I have to remember is how much autonomy and how much about the world did you know when you were five? Mm -hmm. How much did you know when you were ten? Right. You know, and that person who met someone when they were maybe twenty, twenty-five, even in their thirties. Okay. How much information, wisdom, knowledge, etc., did you have back then? And how, yeah, maybe I would add, how did you think back? How could you think? What were, faculties were available to you? Yeah, and um, again, it's, it's I, I, I would kind of, um, I would say a parallel with this, with again, the, the, the being loved conditionally. And Rogers talked mm -hmm. about conditions of worth, you know, I'm only a value win. One of those uh -huh. conditions being the idealized version, things like, I should have known. Right, okay. So, I mean, that would suggest, what, you're clairvoyant? Can you see what's going to happen 10 years from now? How, you know, what we're doing is we're judging ourselves. We're judging that person back then through the eyes of the person we are today. We're judging the child through the eyes of the adult. We're judging that 20-year-old right. through the eyes of the 30-year-old. Yeah. And that's often what we're doing. Yeah, and I think too the three-year-old, or what, what is often sort of maybe an elephant in this room you're describing, is that facts in a way don't—they're like a privilege that if if a kid has a narcissistic parent and thereby is being emotionally deprived and maybe abused in other ways, they they have to make their experience fit into the need to stay attached to that parent. So like, you can't—I don't think you can come to kind of like clear-eyed conclusions when they are at odds with maintaining that tie to that parent. And it, I think it, it takes a lot. Like, I think our brains are sort of like, no, I could see things clearly all along. I don't like to think that I had to obfuscate important things or not even know things that in the service of something else, because something else was more important than sort of knowing the truth. Mm. But if you're a kid in this situation, I think those are the facts of the situation. Yes, and it's difficult enough for an adult to understand, but you imagine a child. I mean, narcissism is primarily ego-driven. Everything mm -hmm. is me. Everything is what it mm -hmm. means for me and how it feels for me. It's primarily ego-driven, and a lot of those beliefs, a lot of those rules change from moment to moment, change depending on what mood they're in, change on what suits them. And that's very hard for a child, never mind an adult, to try to keep up with. Yeah. Boy, yeah, and you know, right, and narcissism is ego driven, but you think of a kid age two to five, I mean, right, are, there's people would say they think egocentrically, just 
things are a product of whether they were doing well, good or bad. But then if they're in relation to a parent, boy, I mean, you, know, you really you made that clear, I think, because it's like you've got an adult saying, thinking and being kind of in an ego driven manner, saying I'm good and those around me are bad. And the, the kid has no choice, it seems, but to just suffuse all that mm. as like, oh, I am so, so bad. To accept it. To accept it. It's almost like kind of two children in a way, but one of those children has a lot more yeah. power and authority. That, that, that one of those children might have 30 plus years life experience behind them, but they're still, you know, ego wise, they're still a child. Yes. Yes. And, and again, when it comes to the child growing up, it's, it's different because it's there from the beginning and it, changes from time to time the kids may change roles and so on as an adult going into a relationship like that and i often look at it like this it's it's different the child is born so there's no choice they come up through that the adult mm -hmm. there is a choice which is sometimes why they're berating themselves blaming themselves the way i look at it is this if you imagine you go on a date with someone for the first time First thing you do is you sit down, you say hello, you write the order of the meal, and you're asking them how they are. First thing they say to you is, I don't like your hair like that. Change your hairstyle. I prefer hairstyles like this. You're wearing blue. I don't like blue. Red's my favorite color. Mm. Any friends? Tell me about them. Well, I haven't met them yet, but I've already decided I don't like them. And I'm going to get very uncomfortable if you start spending time with them. So you're going to have to cut them out. What about your family? Are you close? The last thing I want is for you to have people in your life that care about you. So you're going to have to cut them out as well. If you were having a date with someone like that, now, there isn't going to be a second date, is there? Right. What happens? It's a piece at a time. Little piece yeah. at a time. And a little piece at a time, plans might get changed. A little bit of a strop, not necessarily a bad mood, but a little bit of a strop, dragging feet on the way out the door to meet whatever, and they seem a bit withdrawn. So they're not the person's not necessarily being told anything, but they're being shown. Mm. They don't feel comfortable with my family. They don't feel comfortable with my friends. And then behavior starts to change. People start to adapt if you will to this new kind of relationship because there's a lot of love and affection there's a lot of attention there's a lot of kindness there's a lot of passion and so on but a little piece at a time it's being eroded away boundaries are being crossed resources mm -hmm. are being taken and then one day somebody just wakes up and they think you, know, you, you, you phrased it a moment ago I, I will put it a different way some day someone is maybe sitting watching television or they see something on social media or they hear someone else's story and they're talking about whatever it is and suddenly it clicks. Bloody hell, that's happening to me. Mm. And they suddenly get a name for it. They realize it's yeah. not them. They're isolated. They're maybe mm -hmm. dependent on this person somehow. They're no longer, to talk about trauma bonding, they're, they're no longer trauma bonding. That's the both the positive and the negative reinforcement in order to get what you want. So they're no longer seeking the positive reinforcement if that comes that's a bonus even if it's just a few crumbs so they're not necessarily seeking that what they're trying to mitigate is the negative reinforcement a quiet yeah. day is considered a good day mm. oh you said a quiet day is considered a good day yeah, a quiet day could be considered a good day as opposed to the positive reinforcement being really good so they're trying to mitigate mm -hmm. I was hoping there's going to be something good but they will settle for nothing rather than the abuse yeah that would you say a long time oh absolutely i wondered would you say they'd also want to not it when it's happening not lose mm. uh, the person yeah um th there's a lot of different reasons because don't forget the first when they first met that that lovely person they met that's the person that they're in love with and they're hoping that person comes back a lot of the time they want that person to come back i think as well whenever people do leave relationships like that i think one of the reasons they find it so difficult to let go and they ruminate over is they're not necessarily missing the person certainly not missing the behavior 
they're missing the version of them that they fell in love with. Mm. And maybe they're questioning themselves. Would it be different? Or could I do something different? Or will it be better this time? Because there was always that hope of the positive reinforcement, but it never really came. They always fell short. Yeah. It's, it's, so much, it's the version that they were presented with, not the reality. Yeah. I was just thinking like heroin, a, a drug like as severe as heroin, like that addiction process. It seems like there's a lot of parallels. Yeah, but it's like I say, remember, we are hardwired to feel significant to someone, to feel important to someone. And we were very important to that person at one point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe we are, maybe, and you know what? Maybe we really were. Just mm -hmm. maybe the way that we hoped, or the way that we thought. Yeah, I, I think you really laid out, like, why, what's so important to, for someone in this situation to grow to have compassion for themselves in how they ended up in this situation. It's like you said, it's not like someone, you know, shows their wolf face right away. It, it's so subtle and incremental. You know, I, I, I've got a friend, I've known him for many years, and he described it like this. I thought it was a wonderful way of putting it. Do you know the way we sometimes talk about the, the light bulb moment when suddenly something mm -hmm. comes on and it suddenly clicks? He described it for him. He said it was his Planet of the Apes moment. <laughs> Watch that movie, the Charlton Heston movie. It's got one of I, the, It's the most famous twist, I believe, in any movie at the end, you know, when he realizes he was on Earth the whole time. Yes. Yeah, vaguely, but go yeah. ahead. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a famous scene where he, you know, the Charlton Heston character, he doesn't like people. He's kind of antisocial. He volunteered for this mission just to get away from people crash lands on a planet run by apes and humans are the savages and what happens is he's trying to communicate and tell them man is sentient man is not a beast and he's arguing with them that man is better than this better than that and you know the end they just let him go and off he goes and he gets to the end and as he's going along the beach he sees the statue of liberty sticking out of the sun uh -huh. he realizes he was home the whole time so that was that's the huge twist. Hated people, wanted to get away from them, ends up defending them, and then realizes they're now savages because they did that to themselves. So anyway, long story short, this friend of mine, he talks about his Planet of the Apes moment. It's it's the moment when he realized this was not normal. Hadn't mm. been normal for a long time. He said it was like it was like seeing the Statue of Liberty sticking out of the sand. A real, Where? real way of waking it up. Yeah, that's very powerful. seeing. Yeah, yeah. And seeing that person as well. That's who they are. That's what it is. That's what's been going on. That's what's been happening. You described it as pulling that plaster off. Yes, and it's really going to hurt. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But what's the alternative? Keep it on. Yeah. That could be an option. Is it a healthy one? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question, too. I think what leads people to feel able to uh, see mm. what we're talking about and seeing. I, I, I believe it requires safety, in essence. Like, that's like maybe an umbrella term, but connection to other mm. healthy people to develop a different frame of reference, you know, to know that you can now say, oh, this person seems to be narcissistic. And know that you're going to keep on going, keep on being with other people. Mm. It, you, you don't live and die with um, the fortunes in the relationship with that narcissistic person. Mm. Yeah, and I, the, the word you used there is a good word. It's a word I would use quite a lot. I've used it in a few of my videos. Whatever it is you do, you make, your, make sure you are safe. Yes. If you're asserting a boundary, if you're saying no, if you're going gray rock, if you're going no contact, if you're packing your bags and leaving, if you are just giving one word answers, if you're challenging them, it doesn't matter what it is. First and foremost, you make sure you're safe. Mm -hmm. just because, Absolutely. Just because someone has never assaulted you before, don't underestimate them. Don't underestimate yeah. narcissistic rage. And I think our nervous systems, amongst other 
pieces of us get so used to narcissistic abuse that it doesn't even require a physical attack in a lot of cases. It could be the, a, a certain look or just the knowledge that you're around the person or where they are or even within oneself that, I mean, I often work with folks who need time away to, to just sort I don't know, let their systems kind of reconfigure to a degree where the reflex to kind of protect will not be so strong that everything kind of gets shut down as they, you know, begin to question uh, that person. And, and a lot of times, particularly if they've been um, started as a child, feeling safe happens progressively and over years. Uh, to to have that moment of really saying, uh, you know, that's who's behind the mask. Yeah, and, and again, raised in a family, it's been there since childhood. Sometimes it's looking at what does safe actually look like, what does safe mean. Yeah, like, like say what, like <laughs> what? What's the safety you speak of? <laughs> like, <laughs> absolutely. Sometimes for some people, safety just means familiar. But that's not. Yeah. The- if. Right. It's I think it's uh, like there can be a way that's so familiar to ward off danger. Mm. Like, you know, folks have said it's not, you know, safety isn't the absence of danger, sort of the presence of safety, the presence of, you know, what is needed of, of the presence of protection. Mm. And that, yeah, but that is whole, wholly unfamiliar to many uh, scapegoat survivors from childhood. And but what I think it can be discovered and experienced. And I think in that case, the task can be to just paying attention um, to, oh, what does this feel like? Kind of re-encoding something that needs kind of encoding to begin to be able to live from. Uh, People coming out of narcissistic relationships, I often think now, whether it's breaking away from the family or whether it's breaking away from a partner, it's only afterwards, I believe anyway. That's when the healing begins. It's difficult to heal when you're still in that environment. And when someone does come out of that environment now, even if they're in a little apartment or bed set or in a refuge or whatever it is, or they're staying with a friend, when they have that space, what they're really doing, I think, in that initial stage is they're just catching their breath. Mm-hmm. Because they've been in full on survival mode for so long in a lot of ways. Absolutely. I don't you yeah. know, I say that to make it sound over dramatic, but it has been like a kind of survival mode. Mm-hmm. Well, I wholly agree. Yeah. And uh, I suppose the way I illustrate that, that, that resting point is sometimes I would say to people, it's like you're, you find yourself in the water, you're in a boat. Maybe you're quite happy, but for some reason you find yourself in the water. Maybe the boat sinks, it capsizes, pirates take it, whatever it is. You're in the water. You have no choice but to swim. You just have to keep swimming because you know if you stop swimming, even for a second, you're going to drown. Either that or it's going to be even harder to start again. So you have to keep swimming. And on that, on the horizon, a few miles away, there's an island. That's what you're aiming for. And you keep on swimming. But it's only once you're on the island and you are in agony, you're exhausted, you're coughing up seaweed and all the rest of it. Mm. You're, you're absolutely exhausted. But it's only then you start to think, I could have drowned. There were sharks yeah. in the water, I couldn't have Or a shark eating you, yeah. Absolutely. So that period coming out of that, and it can be quite difficult. I don't think the narcissistic person really helps it because often that's when the abuse tends to ramp up the gear. It's either to try try and get you back or to punish you. But one way you are just catching your breath. And I often say to people to take whatever time you need to catch your breath and utilize everyone around you that cares about you. Every piece of Mm. support you can get your hands on. That's wonderful. No, that's such a... I mean, you wouldn't tell the person swimming to, to the island to get away from the shark to kind of really reflect on the shark's malevolence towards them. I, you know, the person could have blo- ble- be bleeding, and you just don't want them to stop. You just want them to swim to get to shore. Yeah, absolutely. Danger is yeah. imminent. But uh, that, that's the way I illustrate it. At the time, you're doing everything you can just to mm-hmm. get and you're burning up a lot of energy, a lot of resources, sometimes not for you, sometimes for the kids as well, or sometimes for the other siblings as well. I don't think it's uncommon sometimes narcissistic families, regardless of the kid's role, 
sometimes the kids, when they grow up, they actually band together against the, the parents. So you're utilizing everything there is. It doesn't happen all the time, but it has been. Yeah, once. sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you can lay in every bit of support. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking of, um, well, we're gaining distance, you know, from the narcissistic abuser, from the shark, as it were. And that's actually one of the three tenets I kind of think about in the process of recovery. And, you know, the other concept is like no contact. And that those are so no contact too. kind of it's such a big, it seems like, concept in the kind of I don't feel like the right right but i don't think it, like i think it's so important here to kind of distinguish um you know it's not about demonizing the narcissistic person or at all and at least in my strong opinion and that's not what going no contact or gaining distance is about i think it's really just about to your your example illustrates self-care awesome. and in the right world Caring for ourselves um, is not injurious to anyone else. But unfortunately, I think in the case of a narcissistically abusive dynamic, it, it gets set up that if the survivor does something to um, care for themselves, they are smiting somehow or another the narcissist. Yeah. And But I don't think it changes the fact that it's for one's own health um, and quality of life necessary to to do what's necessary to care for themselves, which I think, at least at a certain phase, it is gaining distance from the from the abusive impact. Self-interest. Um, yeah, self right. It's unselfish. Where right. People are led to believe it is, but it's not. It's, And I know this is going to sound a little strange because it's, in a lot of people, again, being in, in, in those kind of relationships, are questioning themselves, am I the narcissist? Or... I did this or I did that, does that make me the narcissist? Well, you know, there is a healthy level of narcissism. Narcissism is your survival instinct. It is your self-interest. It's your narcissism that makes you want to go to school, to college, to have a better job, to apply for the promotion. It's your narcissism when you go on a date with someone, you want to look your best, you want them to find you attractive. That's healthy narcissism with I think where we get confused a lot of times when we're talking about narcissism, we're talking about something that is pathological. It's been there a long time. It is all day, every day. It is consistent yeah. and it is pervasive. When it is a disorder, I often think of a disorder. It's the impact that has on that person's day-to-day -day functioning, as well mm -hmm. as the impact it has on the relationship with other people as much as with themselves. And we're talking about something really malignant there, something really toxic. But no, there's a healthy level. Mm -hmm. normal level and self-care you want to call that nor if the narcissist wants to tell you're a narcissist for indulging in self-care and self-interest yeah then go ahead be a narcissist <laughs> no you're right i think no survivor of narcissistic abuse is unfamiliar unfamiliar with being told they were selfish that almost seems like one of the most primary weapons uh a narcissistic abuser will wield against the person accusing others of doing what they do themselves yeah it's i think another uh demonstration of that relocation of you know anything that doesn't kind of reflect uh in sort of gold back to them that all has to be found in someone else not themselves and and when they're doing that and i know we talked about it we talked, touched briefly on the trauma bonding and, and so on and the the stages of of how this happens it's a little piece at a time and that person's trying to leave and again they're maybe being told they're selfish they're doing this they're doing that and how could you do this to me after all i've done for you and pointing out that bicycle i bought you for your birthday when you were 10 you know you might be 40 now but you know still and you're hearing about things like that you know i think i think dostoevsky put it very well i don't think he was talking about narcissism but i think one of his quotes really fits it well um the best way to you know to keep someone prisoner is to don't let them know they're a prisoner in the first place you don't know, let them know don't let them know they're a prisoner in the first place mm. now, i don't know how to paraphrase that but did you know what i mean that that reeling back in and after all i've done for you and then the the projection onto them and the person ends up feeling well i'm better off here it's pretty good here 
And mm-hmm. like, what if I leave? So I don't necessarily know they were a prisoner in the first place. Yeah. That wake up call that we talked about a moment ago, that's when you realize you aren't like this and unhealthy. And I have been a prisoner. And I see, uh, I see other non-prisoners around, and I have a shot at maybe living with them or being around them, not, not just me and this, this other jailer. Yeah, there, there is a, there is a bigger world out there. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it, it can be difficult at first, especially if someone is raised in that. To imagine, oh. to imagine meeting someone and meeting other people. And they are being valued. They are being respected. People are laughing at their jokes. They're asking them questions. They're learning from them. And they're getting to feel a part of something. A very powerful. It can be frightening on one hand, but it's also a very powerful experience when they see something different. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think we're talking about too here, the loyalty that like a child or a partner who's gone through the process you just described with a narcissist grows to feel towards the narcissistic abuser. And, and some of what we're talking about right now is when you get a powerful, you know, very positive experience outside of that abusive system, working to, in essence, switch your loyalties. And there's a lot of guilt, you know, that at least at the outset you might experience or a sense of badness. But, but it's so rewarding when that, I think, when those loyalties get to kind of like convincingly shift to people who are treating, treating one well and genuinely appreciative of who one is as a person. Yeah. And when they start to connect with others and when they start to feel that and, you know, the narcissistic person, the call might be there, you know, the, the sweet siren song or whatever it is, or the guilt tripping, the shaming, whatever, whatever it is. It's not that they're not going to be tempted. It's not that they're not even going to think about it. Right. It's not that they not aren't necessarily going to feel pity or sympathy. But they're far better informed. They can make healthier choices, healthier decisions. Yeah, there's there's options now where there maybe weren't before. Mm. In the case of a parent, you think of, now all relationships have a power balance of some kind, but you think of a parent, how powerful a parent has been through throughout a child's life. But even in adulthood, mm-hmm. that child might still feel as if the parents are very powerful. But when they start to see those other things and maybe they have rules of their own, they become parents of their own, you see that power balance start to shift. Mm-hmm. It becomes a little more, a little more equitable, I, I would say. Yeah. And and I would say, too, maybe the power shift, maybe it can happen with the narcissistic parent or maybe it gets felt just in other relationships that are inherently more equitable. And yeah, they can vary right. in that relationship with the parent. It might be felt, you know, equally, but with the scapegoat or with the, the person who's being abused, there is definitely a shift. Now, whether the parent sees it or not, yeah. or even whether the ex-partner sees it or not. Um, you think of uh, transactional analysis, parent, adult, child, and a lot of people, a lot of different therapeutic approaches, they look at strengthening that adult state. Mm. And when you look at the, the different power dynamics, yeah, someone might be physically taller, they might be physically stronger, they might have more money, they might be more influential, they might be more accomplished in certain areas. But that still does not make them more powerful. On an individual level, we all have the same. Mm -hmm. more powerful. And I know it can feel that way, particularly when the narcissist has you trained to react to a certain look or a certain sound, you know, the way they behave and it suddenly triggers us and we're we're like, we're back there. But ultimately, they're not more powerful than anybody else. The caveat, of course, being, you know, we are not more powerful than them. We all have the same. But once the person begins to realize that with those other healthy relationships where they are a part of something, they will be called out when they do something wrong or whatever, or they misbehave or whatever, but they're also praised and appreciated for other things. They start Mm -hmm. to see something healthier. And I think a lot of times with the unhealthy relationships, that power balance seems to even out a bit. Now, it doesn't matter how the narcissistic person is behaving. Yeah. They begin to see them as they are. Yeah. 
yeah for certain what and and whether they can bring that into that re- relationship or not the survivor knows knows that balancedness in experience and in how they know themselves yeah absolutely yeah. yeah and i think there can be something quite empowering about that and we talked earlier on about distancing managing boundaries is what i would sometimes put it mm. one word answers not being ambiguous that's the route you want to go or if you're if you're putting down a boundary feeling powerful enough that if the person crosses the boundary to show them that there are consequences Mm -hmm. there will be no further contact until or that will be withdrawn until now it's really really difficult and we're maybe talking maybe a while down the road but it is a good healthy place to be yeah it's interesting too it seems in in healthy relationships the need for um boundaries is it seems far less and the the stakes feel less intense too i mean they're always important but the um man the intensity under which they it can feel like you have to uh assert them with in regard to say someone very narcissistically abusive i guess that's why i think of like the importance of distance first like like getting to the island having some just like recouping your own energies having experiences where you're like oh like I don't need to set boundaries all the time in order for someone not to like intrude into my quiescence. And as that feels more like the new normal, then it's maybe like, okay, now I'm ready to go into this person who insists on treading on me as a condition of our relationship and saying no. And if you can't abide by no, these are going to be the consequences. It's a big undertaking, I think, with someone who's narcissistically abusive. It is, and I think it's difficult as well for someone who suffered narcissistic abuse. When we do talk about boundaries, we talk to, about setting boundaries. Any boundaries they had were constantly crossed. Okay. Yeah. And selfish and unreasonable for having them in the first place. So there is that kind of difficulty grinding that, you know, that on one hand I don't like it, but on the other hand it, it should be allowed. Coming out of that, yeah, it can be difficult to set boundaries because they weren't there in the first place. Someone maybe outside does cross a boundary. They might find themselves as if they're right back there again, or they might maybe explode aggressively. There's a lot of different things in between, but they're not really communicated and um, maybe appropriate. But the more they learn, and when it comes to those boundaries, sometimes people cross boundaries because they didn't know they were boundaries. Mm -hmm. tell them and they're probably okay they'll apologize and they won't do it again having healthy relationships like that the person starts to recognize their boundaries don't have to be rigid they can be flexible they can change because they're their boundaries right the only times they maybe need to keep an eye on their boundaries if they are back in the company of that person who would be trying they're the only times they need to be rigid. Yeah. That's what they choose. Yeah. Yeah, right. I think it's important to have experiences on both sides of that fence. Maybe more on the the flexible side. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, but yeah. Flexible, and think about being, you know, flexible. I often, uh, I talk about boundaries like your house. Now, mm. if you left your windows and your door open, do you know what? You'd come home from work and you'd find your house empty. Mm-hmm. Where you'd find people in your house watching your television, eating your chocolate biscuits. People would just be doing what they wanted. Right. If you kept your windows and doors locked all the time, no one would ever get in. But then you would never get out. Mm-hmm. Think of your boundaries like your house. It's up to you whether or not you open the door or the windows. Sometimes it's warm, you might want to. Sometimes it's cold, you might want to close them. Right. Someone comes to your door, it's up to you whether or not you open it. It's up to you whether or not you invite them in or keep them on the doorstep. Do you ever notice no one ever challenges you for that? Mm. You have control over it. There's boundaries. You can be flexible. You can control them. That's a good analogy. It's getting there, though. Right. A lot of different obstacles. And I'm just... Curious, I know we have talked about a few things, but you know, what would your thoughts on, on the obstacles for someone to get to that point? What sort of things do you notice come up? 
to get to where they're kind of um, feel ready to apply yeah. such boundaries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I would maybe lump, maybe I would understand your question is kind of like the, maybe I'll interpret it as the process of recovery, yes. like what goes into that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I really think of it as like, and we touched on it a bit, but really like three kind of pillars, I'll call them, of recovery. Um, first is making sense of what happened. In essence, to, to know, or at least understand at the beginning that it wasn't your fault. Um, and, and, and the, third, or the second pillar is gaining distance from the narcissistic abuser. And I would really say psychological, emotional, maybe physical distance under that heading. Um, uh, and third is learning to live in defiance of the narcissist's rules. Uh, I like that term, living in defiance. Thanks. Yeah, no, I think it's so important uh, because there's such a conditioning like we've been talking about of like, here's what you need to do to keep the narcissist happy. But his or her happiness is contingent on, in essence, I think you, the survivor, being unhappy. So doing things, structuring your life, finding relationships that involve you being happy, I think in, at its core is living in defiance you know, of the narcissist rules. Um, but I also think these three pillars are kind of like, maybe for the stool, like they're, they're, they need to be kind of fairly balanced. Yeah. Um, that doing any of them kind of to the exclusion of the other, I think can compromise the, the sense of overall safety that the three pillars, I think, work in tandem to, to build and help the survivor accrue, you know, over the course of kind of recovery. There's, a, there's another piece, and it's kind of woven into these pillars, but really it's about finding and maintaining connection to others, to I'll call them safe others, throughout all this, um, and that that itself is kind of often a new undertaking, particularly for someone who's maybe only known relationships with narcissists or something related to narcissists, say in their family. Um, but it really feeds each of those things, gives you a different frame of reference when you're understanding what what was happening, what was really happening. Um, kind of countering the guilt that can one may feel when you're switching loyalties from the narcissistically abusive family or partner to people who treat you well. I, I think getting more and more of those experiences where you're being treated well, you're being responded to by itself is sort of like, no, this is where I want to be. Uh, and it, it counters that guilt. It counters a sense of like, I'm committing treason. But it's almost like, a hard argument, I think, to have in one's mind by itself. You got to keep having these kind of good experiences. Yeah, it, I think it comes down to you know having those experiences, having an honest conversation with yourself. Mm. Things like um, an honest conversation, yeah, difficult, but that's not the same as impossible. Not right now. It's not the same as not ever. You know, there's different ways of looking at, at having a, an honest conversation. Yeah, it's understanding it and agreeing. So. Yeah, understanding it wrong. Understanding what happened can be a very mm -hmm. powerful thing. It's that old expression, knowledge is power. And I think one of the dangers there is sometimes what we do is we go down these rabbit holes of almost like trying to diagnose someone. Right. Sometimes we can do that and whatever, but understanding it is one thing, but also understanding ourselves. And that's what I mean by having an honest conversation with ourselves. Even that person who was young and met that person who was dazzling, they were attractive, they were wonderful, and then they're berating themselves. Why did I not see and why did I you know have an honest conversation with yourself? Sometimes that honest conversation is you believe the lie. That doesn't sit well. But you, you know, you're, you're also paying attention to how you felt. Yes. And, and maybe considering those feelings as kind of legitimate because you have them as opposed to like i have to prove it or i have to i have to prove these feelings are legitimate by saying this person was this bad or something i think generally this part of the un making sense of it is like over time it's like if you feel this bad something was awry out there something, anyway something wasn't quite right um when you're talking about how we felt at the time, I again, I think this is why people sometimes 
go back, they're ruminating, things like that. It's how they felt in the early days. It's sometimes the thought of losing that person, that parent, that partner, whoever they happen to be. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can feel as if they're losing a part of themselves. Yeah. And this is what I mean by having an honest conversation with ourselves. Because it feels like we're losing a part of ourselves if we let that person go. Now, I don't mean forget about them or cut them out or pretend they're, they don't exist, pretend it didn't happen. No, letting them go just means that. Letting them go, leaving them alone. Yeah, yeah. And I think when it comes to, if you've had like a narcissistic parent mm. and you've had to kind of like, kind of uh, define like what attachment means according to that person, it's a profound thing you could f fear losing yeah. when you say losing your, a piece of yourself. You could even fear, and, and rightfully so, I think, fear losing yourself, you know, fear becoming nobody to no one. And I think that, Kind of recovering or working through that sort of trauma that it probably was kind of what the threat was when one was young yeah it requires like certainly an honest conversation but also like dosing regularly of of connection to, so the system your one system knows that threat is no longer real but boy is that a is that a process it is you know and when you mentioned the living in defiance, I, I, I do like that term because sometimes the things I say um, in the therapy room, and sometimes I put it in one or two of the videos as well, is you start doing the things they didn't want you to do. Now, within reason, of course, mm -hmm. incur, you start doing the things they didn't approve of. Go mm -hmm. listen to that music that they didn't like. They told you to switch it off every time you come into the room. Watch those movies. They say were nonsense. Go and, go and have a drink. I'm not saying get drunk and you know go crazy or whatever. If they didn't approve of drinking, go and have a beer just to see what it's like. You decide whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. you, sure. You do the things that they disapproved of. Not in the sense that you're being this open rebel or whatever, but what you're doing is you're starting to get a piece of yourself back. Now, in the case of a relationship, maybe with someone who's met later on and they're maybe coming out of it, looking at those things they used to enjoy, at those things they would have liked to enjoy, at those places they would have liked to have went, you know, places they might have wanted to go on holiday, the other person talked them out of it or ruined it or whatever. Do you know what? Go yourself. Go with a friend. Do the yeah, thing you moved off. Yeah, and the thing, I, that's, that's a great point. I also think there's, like, things they sort of silently disapproved of, you know, which often are like things that like your own ambitions, your own, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like it's like, it could, it could even be like working out, exercising or working towards a, a really like important professional goal you have or academic goal. Cause the standing, the, the sense of like, Oh, like this is who I am in the world. Those kinds of experiences afford us. Like, yeah, it's just, it, those are, typically so at odds with what a narcissistically abusive person would want. And I, I think if you did pursue those things, they'd find ways to discount it or absolutely know why it was foolhardy or doesn't count. Um, but boy. Here, here's the curious thing. It's the curious, and this is not uncommon with parents. If the child go now they, they disapprove. The child wanted to do something or whatever and the child the, the parents disapprove and they go do it anyway and become quite successful you suddenly appear saying you know look how proud we are look at how well we pushed and it gets yeah. that much, you know right. <laughs> isn't it funny they, they'll either take credit for it or they will just ridicule it and scorn it yeah once it reaches maybe a tipping point where <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's I know it makes no sense, and it can be quite comical. But remember, this is ego driven. It's always it's always about how I feel about it. You no, know, you're right, and there's a like a sort of a lack of um, like self recrimination or or I don't know, like humility about that. I, I I know what you're talking about. It's like a switch, like oh yeah, now like yeah, we're in your corner uh, to the person who has achieved in spite of all that contempt and hostility. Without a sense of oh, I'm contradicting myself or I'm being hypocritical, 
Yeah, but there isn't even this, do you know what? I was wrong. You've done really well and I'm very proud. Right. Of you. Now, right. You know, a child me, it doesn't matter what age the child is, by the way, but the child likes to hear things like that from their parents. Yeah, it's like part of, it's almost like oxygen. You need yeah. that to. Uh, They'll never get it. Never get no, it. and that's, I think, can be a real, a, a, a trying thing for someone in recovery as an adult mm. when, you know, it's almost like the, the narcissistic abuser stops affording them that resistance, that opposition. And now like, oh yeah, I'm, I love everything you do. I'm, I'm in your corner and it's like, like what? Like, like you sort of think you're in the boxing ring or something. And now. Yeah. Where did this come from? What's that about? Yeah. Like what? It's yeah, quite a switcheroo. Absolutely no sense at all. But yeah, it's doing those things. That are part of that recovery, living in defiance, it's doing the things that they disapprove of. Decide for yourself whether you'll, and I've always say within reason, of course. But you're giving yourself permission to make your own mind up. Yeah. And I think it's even a, it's a, it's a tricky, it's a, again, another process. Like, because I think what's been interfering with that is I actually think safety versus danger, that it's been dangerous to know your own mind, know your own preferences, given that those preferences could have compromised a narcissist willingness to be in relationship to you and like um i don't know in my experience generally it's like yeah it's like pieces that get kind of recovered like oh i like this um i like this the narcissist narcissist abuser did not like it for me and maybe too at other times i like this irrespective of that narcissistic abuser which itself is really important to be able to forget the narcissistic abuser <laughs> Is I think a big marker of safety because in essence, like you, you always have to have them in your mind uh, when you're undergoing yeah. undergoing the abuse. Yeah, that's that's what I meant earlier on about it. It can feel as if we're in survival mode. Right. Try to hide those ambitions. Try to hide those thoughts. Try to hide. Try to hide anything that might bring up disapproval. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you're saying it can get, get into a wormhole kind of just like making sense of what happened. I think like that's why at least like, yeah, like in this, the content I try to focus on in uh, like on my channel and stuff is really to focus on the, the survivor themselves, because I think when there is this thing that happens where so much of the focus and attention goes to the narcissistic person yeah. and it can feel I think one can feel very lonely and like um, disoriented when it, when trying to come back to themselves. But if that's done and if attention is sustained on oneself, you know, then you get to kind of live from the center of yourself. That, that healthy narcissism, you know, gets to take root. But it can be subtle how compelling it is to keep the focus on the narcissist. Yeah, I think a recovery. I think there's a healthy level of, if someone were to focus far too much on themselves, then maybe we are talking about narcissism. I'm the only one who's important here. If someone right. is to focus too much on everybody else, it's their needs are much more important, much more than much more important than mine. You become a bit mm -hmm. of a doormat, a people pleaser. It's trying to find that healthy balance in the middle. Yeah. You're paying attention to yourself, but you're paying attention to others as well. Right, which is I, I think that's that's like a beautiful articulation of the goal, mm. and it's like when you've had to pay attention way more to others than yourself, like how do you get? Yeah, you, you're trying to get back to that middle ground. Focus I on tend to feel selfish. Would say again. It's the same that the focus on yourself without feeling selfish. Mm. Right. Right. That, that usually what I find in working with survivors of, of this type of abuse, it's so ingrained to think more about the other. And I often try to reassure, and I, and I believe it, that I, you're not at risk of going too far the other way. Things have been so skewed that what feels or if, if it carries a risk of feeling selfish, it's more than likely healthy and an act of self-care. It's uh... given the condition. I, I think it's about, again, when something is so deeply ingrained and beliefs, as I said earlier, they're factor filling, but they can be so deeply ingrained. Sometimes they're unconscious. We don't even know they're there. They just act automatically. Mm -hmm. It means actively 
I'm always careful how I say this. This this is mm, the word. I have to find a better word than this. It means taking a risk. It means having to take a risk, stepping out of that little narrow band with, that we've had to operate in for so long, afraid to put a foot wrong. It's not so much on eggshells. It's more like being on a minefield, afraid to where, mm. you put, where you put your foot, where you step next. It means taking a risk. And taking a risk, if you try anything at all, you risk failing. Mm -hmm. You also risk succeeding. And for some people, particularly... People have been raised as scapegoats. Succeeding can be every bit as terrifying as failure. Yeah, absolutely. So it means having to take risks. Now I'm going to talk about risks. I always talk about small, measured, little, tiny risks. Practice saying no to somebody, for example, just to see what it's like. In a safe way, you know, you're mm -hmm. ordering a coffee, they ask, do you want milk? Say, no, thank you. See how that goes. You've just said no. Yeah. But just little right. things like that. You ever you seen Fight Club? You know? I'm probably uh, the only person on the planet hasn't, but I know it's very few. Well, no, I think like I like um well uh, so like Brad Pitt's this like guy who's trying to usher in this new world of like mayhem, basically, like like throw out all uh societal conventions and just do all this stuff and he instructs this like legion of sort of guys who are part of this fight club to go out and kind of do what you're describing but on a way bigger scale like in essence go out and start fights with people is kind of the 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 thing but i i put in a video actually recently like something ex exactly along the line of what you're just describing like say don't don't feel like you have to walk super fast uh, across a crosswalk if a car is waiting see what it's like to walk at a normal pace you know all these little things of taking up a little more space in the world. Um, it's like a mini project mayhem kind of thing. Uh, it's just, yeah, really important. And I think the more we do things like that, the more people, if you will, the more they expose themselves to the things they fear. They understand why they fear them in the first place, but the more they expose themselves in those little small ways, you, they tend to become more courageous. They tend to become more confident. And it's a little piece at a time. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, right? I think you also experience less uh, fear. Like, you know, I mean, you know, they say like courage is like doing, being, uh, doing something in the face of fear. Mm -hmm. But I also think when you do this exposure, it's like the fear re retreats a bit because the threat is getting yeah. to see. It's not the same as what, what it would have been if the narcissistic abuser was waiting in the car and you're crossing in front of them. Like, they're going to be revving the accelerator and you don't want to saunter. You want to get the heck across the street. Um, yeah. I don't know. So, some sort of like the, oh, I'm living in this world now as opposed to the other one, too. Yeah. And it's, uh, we keep on saying it, but it is a journey. And I often encourage people, anybody watching this, to be patient with yourself, to give yourself compassion, to give yourself space and build on what is working for you. Start to rule out what hasn't been working. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that compassion and patience um, with oneself, it by itself is antidotal to the abuse. Yeah, um, and it can be hard. I think the hope, managing one's hope, is important, and kind of recognizing it is a process and a journey is important. Because I mean, days are going to be tough. Like in the, I have a, a Facebook group that accompanies this this course, mm -hmm. and every Friday I'll I'll, I'll ask for um to for folks to post moments of progress mm -hmm. and to kind of like put a hashtag so you can kind of observe your progress over the week. But some really, I think, it's just brilliant times folks have said like, well, I'm going to put progress that maybe it was a really rough day, but I didn't chastise myself for having the rough day, right? I wasn't impatient with myself. That's the progress. Mm. And I, I just think it's such a beautiful illustration of like... That is. That's, that's a very powerful illustration, sharing things like that. Again, a lot of times we focus on how difficult it was and let's not take away how difficult the day has been or a moment has been but looking at those other things as well um 
you know, some people find it helpful to to write little things at the end of the day. Today I learned. Today I helped. Today I felt good. Yeah. It's getting a more balanced approach to the day. Jay, just on that, um, you're talking about your Facebook page. And for anyone watching this, how can people find you on Facebook and, and so on? How can they connect with that and even enroll in your course? Sure. Um, well, I would say I, I would maybe the probably easiest way to, to find out about these resources is go to my web page. Um, and, and there has links to the Facebook page, but it also has um, – a, a blog which kind of has a lot of what I've written about narcissistic abuse and links to videos. You can also go to the YouTube channel itself, which the weekly videos show up. And then on my webpage is uh, the online course, which um, you know you can click the link there, and it, it goes in I think in more depth about you know these a series of videos that uh, tackle those three pillars of um, uh, making sense, gaining distance, and living in defiance. Um, and then talks about that Facebook group, which, you know, I think is if those are the pillars that the Facebook group is kind of the cement or the glue that kind of helps co congeal uh, those pillars where folks get to share their own stories, read about other stories and have an ongoing sense of support and continuity with folks who know what it's like um, to go through this and to progress through it. Um, I think there is something very powerful in, in people being able to support each other, to share their experiences, what works, what doesn't, and getting that feeling of connection, the connection that people don't have when they're in a narcissistic relationship. I'm exactly. gonna put, okay, I will put links to your channel, to your website, and so on in the description of this video so people can find it there as well. Is that okay? Oh, sure. Absolutely. No, thank you. So. It's been absolutely wonderful talking with you. This has been, I've learned a lot from you today. I do appreciate your time. Well, me as well, Darren. It, it's been a blast. Uh, I'm really thrilled you put this together. No. And, and I'm very appreciative of the opportunity, too, to come on your channel and talk with you and your, and your audience. Well, it's, it seems a lot of people that watch my channel seem to watch yours as well. So there we go. <laughs> Sometimes people a mention you and the things that you're doing, so it's good to know that way. And I've been following you for quite a while and watching your videos, so it has been really good for me. I have really enjoyed that today, and hopefully we could maybe do this again sometime. I'd love that, yeah. Thank you. Until the next time, listen, you take care and speak again. Bye now. Bye.